Well, Ben Shalom and Chris Eubank Jr. coming out after Eubank's fight scene. As soon as Crush has finished his band that he's serving, we could do business. Band that he's serving? Oh my God, how can that be? Hey, how can that be? Two and a half years, we got an explanation, all lies they've told. And he's serving a band after all. Nobody wants to talk about it. Hey, pop, pop, bang. Hey, and welcome back to the number one podcast in the sport that's slightly confused. So, we've had about two and a half years, probably a bit longer now, haven't we? Of vilifying Russians in our media. Our press has done nothing but hammer Russians. Putin's a maniac, a psychopath. Russia has no democracy, has no economy. Um, in about five years, there will be no Russia. All these sorts of things that we sort of dug up from the Cold War, haven't we? And then we're kind of surprised that when two Russians fight, most of the world doesn't care. And people listening to this will care, obviously. So it's kind of a, a self-selecting sample. But in terms of the rest of the world, no one cares that Arta Baturbiev is fighting Dmitry Bivol. No one. This is the ultimate hardcore fight. Now, most sports businesses and franchises are built on the idea of an attraction. So there's always an attraction. Example, when the Lakers play the Boston Celtics, right? Legacy. Uh, Magic versus Larry, etc., etc. You can easily lean into that. The two most successful franchises in NBA history, the Bulls, MJ's team. There are all of these attractions that will bring the general public into the realm okay boxing has them you know, Joshua will still bring people to the yard Fury will still bring people to the yard God, Mike Tyson still brings people to the yard do you see what I mean Mayweather brings people to the yard we, boxing has its attractions Dimitri Bivol is not one and Artur Baturbiev is not one these are not attractions and this fight is literally being sold on the idea of undisputed, but we're at that point now where we kind of don't care about undisputed because what does it mean? Now think about this. Crawford, undisputed at 140, undisputed at 147, fights Israel Madrimov. Looks okay. Just looks okay. And so people are now realizing this undisputed thing doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean that Crawford's not good, by the way. But undisputed isn't this the super title bestowed on someone that means they're Superman. And I think the public are bored of it. I've said this numerous times. We're bored of being told who to love and why. And I think you're going to see that in this fight, that people in boxing will care. People outside of boxing won't really care. And if you're really going to market this fight, you'd really be looking at, actually, who's the real attraction on this card? And the real attraction on this card is Ben Whitaker. Right, whatever you try and talk is Ben Whitaker because that's the guy when you show his highlight reel, everyone's watching it. And there's all this kind of talk of, well, he couldn't do that at the world level, and that's true. You know, he can't do that at world level, but he doesn't need to anymore. He's already done it. Right, he's already done it. He's got the views. The world knows who he is now. He's going to win the titles. But Ben Whitaker's really the the attraction on this card. And then, you know, there's that thing of can Massey cause the upset against Opatai or can Opatai solidify himself in British boxing by actually beating a proper British contender? I mean, that's going to be an interesting one in and of itself. But when you look at the big picture here, for me, this, this always felt like a Saudi misstep. And that's, you know, I love what Turkey's done with Riyadh season. I love what's happening in terms of boxers getting paid. But this felt like the first misstep for me. And it feels, it feels like he's created a gravy train he can't really control. But does he care when the money's flowing like it is? I don't think he does. As long as the, as long as the war in Ukraine carries on, oil will be trading at an artificial premium. So they've got money to play with. But this feels like the one that they've got wrong. Like you see a lot of the pictures in Saudi, and you're like, like how is half of British boxing there? Like. What are they all doing out there? It doesn't make sense to me, but it's not for me to to wonder why. I'm just not that interested. 
I'm interested in Whitaker versus Cameron because obviously I've got emotional skin in the game. I'm interested in Massey versus Opataya. I've got emotional skin in the game. I'm less interested in all the other stuff. Actually, no, no, I'm going to put Sky Nicholson in there as well. Like, Eddie Lamb's made me a fan. Like, he really has because I've seen the progress he's made with her. So now I'm intrigued to see, right, what else can he do? Uh, Raven Chapman's an interesting fight. People are now raising, you know, I mean, I, I really did unleash the bottle now. That like, people are now raising, like, you know, is that Raven Chapman clean? They're asking the question. Now, I said it in my Q&A on Wednesday. I'm not one to call people drug cheats unless I have solid information that they're drug cheats. But I'll always point out things that look unusual to me. And that's all That's all I ever say. I just point out stuff that looks unusual. Then the powers that be do what the powers that be do. Hey, but let's talk breakdowns now, right? Uh, that's why you guys have tuned in. And I'm trying to, going to try and remember as much of the card off the top of my head as I can. And show you how memorable it is, I guess. But if we start with the main event... The only thing that can defeat Arta Baturbiev is age. I think he matches up so well for Bivol that only age is really going to defeat him. If he's got to that age and he can't maintain his output like he normally does, it'll be hard for Bivol. So here's the thing. I know people talk about Bivol and the, the hopping in and out and this, that, but Baturbiev grew up in the same system. He knows what that's all about. I mean, he's overcome that from so many other people. Um, he's used to it. So I don't think the things that boggle our mind are the things that will boggle Baturbiev's mind. I think in his head, he knows he's got to get the timing of that jab right. And if he can do that and throw two or three shots off the back of Bivol's jab, it'd be a nightmare for Bivol. I don't think Bivol wants those sorts of exchanges. I think Bivol wants to be in and out, keep his work clean. And I think Baturbiev will... I'm not going to say necessarily try and walk him down, but whether that initial storm, hopefully catch a lot of those shots on the gloves, get get the timing of Bivol's work and then start to do his own work. And you, we know what Baturbi is really good at. What he's really good at is grinding you down. Just hurting you to the point where you're like, actually, do you know what? Maybe it's best if he stops me. And it's not like there there are vicious Baturbi of knockouts that you look at and go, wow, you know, not not at the top level anyway. In that sense, maybe he's different to Triple G. That Triple G has a few of those, but what he does have is that ability to just break you down, push you backwards, break you down, get you in corners, and then just let combinations go. With like he he hits you with those sort of boxer size combinations that you're like, how is he throwing so many punches? And we've never really seen Bivol in that position before. Uh, big guys like, you know, Joe Smith have tried to bully him. It hasn't worked. Um, his mobility is key. But I just think Baturbiev, being from that Soviet system, will will have that mental, how do you put it? The mental calluses required to just cope with all the hopping in and out. And then once he gets his timing, he should work. And I think for Bivol, maybe he's got to fight differently. Maybe Bivol's got to stand and trade a bit more before he starts boxing. Maybe he's got to say to Baturbiev, however you want to do it, I can do it. I'm younger and I'm fresher. That's kind of what you want to do sometimes. You know, when, when you know someone's really good at something, instead of running away from it, run towards it and go, let's find out. A lot of times that seems to be the best, the best way to do it. Like, I'll give you an example. Those people who spend time in boxing gyms will know this. The number of times you see a kid when he feels under pressure going backwards not realizing subconsciously that he's giving his attacker punch distance back. And then when you turn it around and say, no, no, just walk into him. All of a sudden, he's not getting hit anymore. All of a sudden, he's pushing the other guy back. Now it's him getting the all the play. Now, at the top level, it's not that simple. But at the top level, that's how you can turn things in your favor. I think that's going to be the really interesting bit. It's going to be about whether Baturbiev can get that timing nailed so he can find those gaps. And Bivol gives you gaps. Um, there are definitely gaps for left hooks to the head. There are gaps for straight rights over the top of the jab. There, there, there are so many gaps. Yeah, And if I can see them, everyone else can see them. So why hasn't anyone been able to get there? And the answer is timing and not really having the right attack options once you do get the timing nailed. And that's what Baturbiev's got to get right. And then Bivol... Bivol's just got to out-tough Baturbiev and outwork him. If he can do that against a 39-year-old Baturbiev, 
all the belts will be his. And he would have deserved them because he would have had to come through fire to do that. But here's the thing, and we, we need to really have this honest conversation where people are saying, oh, if Baturbiev does this, he's the greatest light heavyweight of all time. If Bivol does it, he's the greatest light heavyweight of all time. And I'm like, stop that. These two guys, if they'd, if they'd fought, like in that kind of Clinton Woods, uh, Glenn Johnson, Antonio Tava, Roy Jones era, they would have just had years taken off their careers a lot sooner because those fights were all tough. I'm saying that there would have all been factors in those, but Bibbo's not getting away with all that stuff against Roy. No chance. Uh, that that was that was a really tough era. And then you're going back to guys like Dwight Muhammad Kawi, Matthew Saad Muhammad, uh, Eddie Mustafa, all those sorts of real nasty hard men like Baturbiev would have been perfect in the 70s because everyone was a Baturbiev in the 70s at light heavyweight. And we haven't even talked about someone like Bob Foster. Can you imagine Bob Foster in there with Bivol? Those long arms just whipping left hooks at Bivol as he drops his right hand. So in the social media age, people love to be experts and say so-and-so is the greatest of all time, but they don't really understand what greatness is in any given weight division. So let's not be stupid and talk about that. But you're going to get the idiots in front of the camera saying that because it gets views and they think it gets under the skin of people like me. But it doesn't. It just shows ignorance. So we've got to touch on the heavyweights, right? Um, Wardley versus uh, Fraser Clark 2. I think... The, will the rematch be as good as the first one? I don't think it will. I, I'll tell you the reason I say that. That would have scared both men. Like, they they went to the well and beyond in the first fight. And what happens after that is you get, you do, you get scared because you're like, how many more of these can I do? How many times do I want to be in that position? And it's not a world title fight. So I think you're going to see both guys go back to something a bit more conservative. Definitely from Fraser Clark's perspective because he's probably got the more, more levers he can pull. But if you look at it from a Fabio perspective... He's probably trying to get a stoppage, isn't he? But what he's not trying to do is have another another 12-round war. And I think that's the right thing to do. I think what you're going to get there... And it was interesting seeing both men at the press conference. Like, the size difference is significant. Fraser looks like he's going to come in around, like, 270, 280. I can't even tell based on, on how he looked. But he looks enormous. And... I've wondered why he he carries that much weight when he never used to. Like, he was a big lad before, but he wasn't this big. And my theory on it is he needs the weight because he can't generate force. Maybe he's got a back injury or hip injury, but if you watch Fraser Clark, he's not very mobile in the hip area. He just isn't, which is what he'd want to be able to do in order to transfer the force. So maybe he just needs that ballast up top so he's got something he can throw at people. I don't know be interesting to find out if he does carry a, a chronic back injury and that's what stops him twisting because I saw it when David did his comeback when David Hay did his comeback he couldn't fully rotate into his shots because of the back injury now in terms of how you go about it if you're Fraser Clark I, I think you've just got to outwork Fabio you've got to make sure that he hasn't got space because Fraser's boxed like his whole life right and so Fraser can see opportunities Fabio can't just because of that experience. But I don't think he made the most of it. I think he tried to prove that he was the man in the, in the ring that night. And I think if I'm coaching Fraser Clark, what I'm trying to have the conversation about is more look for the openings. Start breaking him down. Start taking him apart. Um, you know, if he's going to spend all that time in the Ben Davidson Center, you know he's not learning much. So see if you can start to shoot a jab and shoot a left hook to the body. Get out of range work again all those sorts of sorts of things that will start to frustrate Fabio when you start to show that ability to to dissect someone that's when you show your class and I, I'd expect Fraser to be trying to do more of that than trying to bomb someone out because that didn't work for him before and if he does try and bomb him out again then you'll know that Fraser Clark has no ability to learn but I think Fabio's got to try more of the same and he's got to he's got to just go in there and say, I'm going to throw four shots and hope that Fraser Clark makes a mistake and I catch him properly. Because once I've got him going, I know I'm going to drag him into, into a battle. And so that's what he's going to be trying to do. And, you know, he's dropped him before, so he knows he can drop him again. 
And I think that's what's going to make this fight really, really intriguing. But you could almost see these guys having a trilogy. This has got just Sora versus White vibes to it, all along where maybe they just can't help but get dragged into each other's kind of fight. And Saturday night, we're going to see something not as manic as the first fight, but hopefully something equally as intriguing. Um, I just want to talk briefly about Sky Nicholson, because like I said at the beginning of the show, I hope Sky Nicholson wins. And I hope Sky Nicholson puts a good beating on Raven Chapman. Yes, there's an Eddie Lamb bias on my on my side, 100%. But I always look at Sky as someone who's doing it the right way. You know, you can never really confirm it, but you get a feel. She's doing it the right way. And so we should support that. We should support that. Um, I think she's in for an interesting fight, but I think she's too mobile. Arms are incredibly long. Like, she could literally just pepper Raven Chapman or fight maybe get a stoppage. If, if they've been working on power shots, she might get a stoppage. But I'm intrigued to see what Sky Nicholson does. I'm always going to watch what Ed does because obviously Ed's a mate. But I hope she does well. Um, like I said, there were too many red flags in what I saw this week. So I'm definitely backing Sky on that one. And it's, you know, let's talk about the, the wider implications. It's good to see women's boxing getting a shot. Uh, I'm also hoping that this means that Natasha Jonas has an opportunity to fight on one of these cards and maybe that's the Natasha Jonas Swan song you say right we're going to do a 5v5 and Natasha Jonas versus Katie Taylor is part of that 5v5 early next year that's that's my North Star that's what I want to see if if they can't make that fight then just stop having women's fights on, on Saudi shows it doesn't make any sense so it brings me on to the fight I'm most intrigued by I'm most intrigued by this Jack Massey versus Jaya Pattaya fight because when you look at them, they have so many parallels. I think um, I think Jai might have had a longer AM career. I'm not even sure. Well, in terms of, he might have turned pro earlier than Jack. I'm not sure. I'd have to confirm that. But both guys have kind of been in the shadows, right? And they've had these careers that don't make sense until recently. Jack was in the wilderness. He hopped from promoter to promoter to promoter. Never really had that career leadership that he deserved. Um, and I've always felt that his talent never got the real chance it needed to flourish. We're seeing it now to an extent, but I do argue that let's say he'd gone to Joe, fresh out the amateurs. I think Jack would be in a stronger position now, just as a talent. It's just my opinion. I think he would have been given the right things and the right exposure. He would have been around guys like Callum Smith and Callum Johnson a lot earlier, and that might have helped him on as well. But we are where we are, so let's not dwell too much on that. But they've both had those careers where, for a lot of it, it was like, where are they? And all of a sudden, they've sort of come to the boil at the same time. And now we've got, we've got that kind of representation of both nations' working classes, right? So you've got Jaya Pattaya, um, Pacific Islands background, obviously, um, know expressive which is within their culture very expressive a bit more flair than jack jack's you know that kind of derbyshire cheshire kind of grittiness yo get on get on fucking job man get on fucking job get on job big right hand there jack go on lad i'm taking the piss but you know what i mean like real gritty hard working you know represent the people from where you're from and so these guys are now going to meet and it's going to be that real clash of that sort of blue collar style from each nation. And I think this, this could be a closer fight than people are, are assuming because remember Jack took React Paul's hardest shot, came back to give him hell. And we saw Jack against Joe Parker. And we know Joe can dig a little bit, definitely compared to a cruiserweight. And Jack rode through that. So Jack's toughness not, is not in question here. For Jack Massey to win he has to be tactically astute and he's got Joe for that so I'm not here to tell Jack how to win I'm just saying things I would like to see I'd like to see Jack get territorial control so I'd like to see Jack just position himself in areas that Jai doesn't like you know, and then go from there you know, there's no point in trying to meet Jai Pattaya in the trenches in an area where he's comfortable just make it uncomfortable for him that's it like you know what I mean? The rest of it will happen on the night, but I'll just write that. Make tonight uncomfortable for Jai. 
That's what he's got to do. And then if you're Jaya Pattaya, number one, you've got to match Massey's work rate. Because you know Jack's going to come in at three shot minimum, right? So you've got to be able to go, right, if he comes in with three shots, the four shot's mine. And I know exactly where it's going to land. Bang. You know what I mean? If he comes in with a single shot, I know that's just bait for the three that are going to come afterwards. So I'm not going to fall for that. And it's all those those little chess moves that hopefully these guys, and they're both, you know what I mean, good pedigreed fighters. And I hope we see both guys show that side of it. it at least initially. And then, you know, you can give us you can give us a dog fight towards the end. I don't mind that. But if you were to ask me who wins, I think it's 60-40 in Jai's favour, but I'd like Jack to win. Because I think Jack deserves a world title. For, for, for the fact that all that Sky Cruiserweight action was happening and they kind of kept Jack to the side for a while. I'd like to see him in the mix for a bit. You know, as I always say, let him get some money, married man now, family man. Let him get a house so he doesn't have to worry about those sorts of bills going forward. So yeah, I'd, I mean, that's going to be a good fight. I've got nothing bad to say about Jaya Pattaya. I think he's been a class act. I think he represents his country well. But I'm always going to back my side. Although if he won, I'd also congratulate him and say, mate, you know, keep fighting Brits. Like, don't, don't even fly back to Australia, man. Just get yourself a house in Saudi and start fighting more of these Brits. Fight a react poor. You mean, show us that you're willing to go through these storms. And then, you know, we go from there. But I think that's a good fight. Um, Whitaker versus Cameron. If you look at the names involved in the story, I think it's a great, like, it's a great showpiece. And I remember I said Ben was the attraction earlier. This is like a great showcase for Ben, right? But remember, Liam Cameron is a small middleweight. And I don't say that disrespectfully. Liam Cameron was, a, was an amateur at 69, 69 kilo. So he's a welterweight, really. Turn pro was fighting guys like Sam Sheedy at 158, 159 pounds. That's what he's weighing in at. You're fighting someone in Ben Whittaker who's genuinely six foot three and genuinely walks around. I reckon Ben walks around 190 pounds. And I'd be confident that he'll be in that ring somewhere close to 190 pounds on Saturday night. Liam won't be. Do you know what I mean? Like Liam, Liam will be 178 tops. And that's not going to be like a a mature 178 pound physique because Liam's a smaller guy. He's still got to let whatever additional masses sort of built up solidify. Ben's been solidifying that, man. I remember that guy doing kettlebell presses with 32 kilo dumbbells. So, and that was four or five years ago. So like that physique is mature and solid, but it would be a good showcase because if Ben is off on any aspect of his game, Liam will jump on him. Liam's game as they come. It's the kind of fight you want. Liam, Liam's no mug. You know, he was described as a journeyman. I said, I don't know if Liam Cameron's a journeyman just yet. He might become that gatekeeper guy, but journeyman? Yeah. In this country, we don't want those connotations, really, because you know, what, you know what people are saying when they say that. But happy for both guys. Ben gets his showcase in a bit of dough, um, which is going to help his, his brand, so you never know. He might be in the next Gucci advert, and he deserve it. Uh, just from the bits and bobs I've been hearing and sparring, like it's been less of the flair stuff and more of the gritty stuff in the Whitaker camp. Because so I think there's a real understanding that the Liam Cameron fight is probably the last time that he's going to have things in his favour in terms of height, reach, size, all of that. And going forward, you're now looking at some of those bigger names, those more mature names. And so Ben, he's got to be ready for that. In terms of Liam... Liam's never a light heavyweight. Liam's super mid at best, probably a middleweight. I wouldn't be surprised if Liam could make middleweight. But Liam's such a lovely guy. Um, the four years of his career that he lost were heartbreaking because Liam's not a guy that meddles with cocaine. You, know, you can get caught up in the, in the wrong crowds and stuff and you know hold the wrong 20-pound note. But was never a drug user. Just a lovely kid. Very uncomplicated man from Sheffield who can fight. Like, Liam Cameron's one of those people, if you're in a tight spot, you call him up, he'll be there for you. And I hope people come out of this whole weekend with a higher level of regard for Liam Cameron because he is a good guy. And I, I'm confident you could have Liam Cameron jump in with a lot of our Brits at super middleweight and he's competitive. So why don't we do that? Let him and guys like Reese Cartwright go at it. Let, let's see some of these fights. 
uh, you know, on TV because obviously we're not going to get the big names anymore. So let's see these guys on on Sky Sports and on BBC. I'd quite like to see that. But I think, yeah, I think this is Ben's last real showcase fight before you got to start putting him in me- meaningful title fights. But look, overall, it's a it's a solid card, and I don't know, I really don't know, because. I don't know that we've been starved for so long of these sort of meaningful fights. And all of a sudden, we're getting them all in a short space of time. And like you don't feel the excitement. The closest thing I can think of is, I don't know if anyone's ever been on like a fast or a diet, right? And you spend ages thinking, all I want to do is, I want to get my Amigos burger. I want to get an 18-inch pizza. I'm going to get some milkshakes. I want to get this. I want to get like 10 cans of Red Bull. I just want all of that stuff I've been denied, right? And you get halfway through the pizza and you're like, oh my God, this feels terrible, right? It happens. Like, I don't know if anyone's ever done Ramadan. The first time you do Ramadan and <laughs> you try and gorge yourself and all the stuff you've been deprived of, you just feel like crap. And I, I kind of feel like that about boxing because look, we, we're going to go Joshua Dubois September, Bivol Baturbiev October. Fury Usyk, December. Um, supposedly the 5v5 with the Joshua Dubois rematch. And, I mean, like, in February. That's exhausting. And if you're a boxing fan, you're definitely not traveling to all of those, right? So, so all of these fights are going to happen that are of interest to us as fans, but they're not spread out enough that we can really digest them. Like, I still think I'm processing a lot of the kind of post-Joshua Dubois kind of thought processes and and ideas and now I'm straight into this one and part of it is down to injuries and stuff and I get that but we need to do away with a lot of these rematches like these rematches are messing things up because let's be honest Fury versus Uzi wasn't close if that had gone on for another two rounds that would have been the end of Fury so it wasn't close Fury wasn't in the ascendancy towards the end it wasn't like the Wilder fight where you're like I'd like to see this again because this feels close Usyk was a handy winner. And all we're doing is giving Tyson a chance to get his pride back. I don't think rematches should be used for that. Joshua Dubois wasn't even close. All we're doing is giving Anthony Joshua a chance to get some pride back. I don't think we should be doing that. If Dimitri Bivol wins or if Arthur Baturbiev wins, I don't want to see a rematch. I don't care. And boxing fans need to start being honest because they're always, oh man, I want to watch a rematch. I want to watch it again and again and again. But those people who do all that talking are the same people who stream the fights. So we need to stop listening to them. Right? I want boxing to move on. I want new blood to come in. I, I want us to have a permanent cycle of just new blood coming through. Because we've been stuck in this loop of all of these guys. And it's like, can we just move them on, please? And get the new lot in. And so this brings me back to the point I was making about why these Saudi cards worry me. So you're flying... You're flying Trainer X plus his team. So that's that's three of them, right? We'll say three or four of them. Then you're flying out the fighter. Okay, so that's five people. Then you're flying out additional boxers. That's probably six, seven, eight people. I have one flying business class. That's four and a half to six grand a flight. And then you're paying for people who aren't even connected to this. Like, people who don't have fighters are just there milling around, right? If you really want to help secure boxing's future, and you're from Saudi Arabia, take all of that money, tell all of these guys to stay at home and watch it. They don't need to be in Saudi Arabia. Put that money into a pot and say, we will help British amateur clubs produce champions. If you're struggling with your rent, we will help you. If you're struggling to buy bags, we will help you. If you need to put a new iframe across your gym we will help you that's the most impact the saudis can have i know people want to talk about sport washing and let's talk about that for a sec if the saudis are sport washing what was london 2012 if the if if the saudis are sport washing what's euro what was euro 2020 if the saudis are sport washing i mean what's the premier league We've been sport washing. The reason why so many people play rugby around the world is because we've been sport washing. It's what we do. Britain and America sport wash. That's how we show how great we are. 
So why do people complain about the Saudis doing it? Yeah. This idea, and, and I, I can answer that actually. It's because that's what you've been told to believe. And I'm not here speaking up for the Saudis, by the way. What I'm saying is the test must be applied consistently and we don't apply it consistently. We sport wash, they sport wash, the US sport washes, every country sport washes. You wouldn't burn that much cash. France sport wash with the Olympics. You wouldn't burn that much cash for any other reason. Do you know what I mean? If you really wanted to maximize your bang I mean, per buck, you'd invest it in something else. So sport washing shouldn't be the issue. But if the Saudis do want to make an impact amongst British boxing fans, solve the grassroots problem. Because that's your supply line. That's your guaranteed supply line. Solve that, su- solve that supply issue and you'll be heroes forever. But see, something that's really interesting is how little energy the British promoters give a card like this when their guys aren't headlining. And I know people say, yeah, yeah, that's to be expected. But you're being flown out because you're capable of fulfilling a certain role. And that role doesn't seem to be fulfilled in this one. No one one outside of the boxing bubble is particularly interested in this fight. Like, you know, I talk to the kids in the gym and they're interested, but no one's really talking about it. You're not seeing the, the same level of interest, which is understandable. That's two guys from Russia. As I said right at the beginning of the show, when you demonize the country, you demonize its people. Uh, what else can you say and then the last thing I want to just say before I wish you guys a good weekend is let's have a proper campaign against these undisputed fights they, they don't achieve anything they don't solve anything they've held the belts up and they've they've basically ruined careers right and I'll give you a good example Dan Aziz should have fought for a world title at some point by now on that run that he was on he should have fought for a world title Joshua Boatsy should have fought for a world title and had they done so that would have freed up some belts for guys like Ben Whitaker to come through. And I was like, where's Carol Atalma? Does anyone know where Carol Atalma is? Because he's gone quiet. But, I mean, he was meant to be decent. <sighs> Boxing's so cruel. Um, you, you look at the heavyweights. Everyone's just parked up because these two wazics that have held the belts for like the best part of two years are still dithering. Boxing needs to move on. It's... In my opinion, boxing needs to move on and pass this phase because this was a dark phase for boxing. And we need to move into a new phase where guys are prepared to take a few losses as long as they can make their money and entertain the fans. It frustrates me. It must frustrate all of you guys, the fact that we don't even know who the next superstars are. We don't know who the next legends are because we've been stuck on the same record for about three years. If it wasn't AJ... Wilder, it was Fury Wilder, then it was um, Fury Wilder. It's time we moved on. I think we can all agree on that. It is genuinely time that we moved on. Actually, last thing I want to talk about is this December 14th card. So, PBC are going to do a December 14th card that's going to be headlined by Tank versus, we don't even know. You know I mean? We actually don't even know who this guy is. It's not Loma. But they were in talks with Loma for ages. And somehow that fell through, and I can't tell you why, but that fell through, and now Lomachenko is considering, well, maybe I need to retire. And then out of all of this, we're seeing that Jamal Charla wants to come back, um, and he's saying, I'll fight Caleb, Caleb Plant, I'll fight whoever. Yeah, great. But my worry in all of this, and I sound like a broken record saying this, but my worry in all of this is Al Heyman like there are rumors that Al's ill so are we seeing the end of Al Heyman's involvement in boxing are we seeing the end of PBC and if so what does that actually mean for American boxing because the top ranked stable looks full I don't think they could sustain any more names Golden Boy don't seem to put on enough shows to justify additional fighters would having someone like Tank on their books change that and we know Hearn would take all of them in a heartbeat right because that's how Eddie works so what's really going to happen a year from now? Where's American boxing going to be? Who's going to control American boxing? Can you imagine if it was Eddie Hearn? That would be the greatest about turn in the history of anything. Because it's increasingly looking possible that the zone could be an acquisition target for the Saudis. 
And my thing is, if the oil price goes up 10%, the zone's definitely an option, right? Presents a credible rival to be in sports and you can build from there. And you'd build a, a fixed broadcast offering as well. Live sport capability through your TV, all of that. And let's see how that goes. But prayers up for Al Heyman if he is ill. And let's hope that there's someone that can take over the PBC and keep it moving forward because, yeah, they've been good. Like, I don't think this modern era of boxing has most of the fights we enjoy if it isn't for Al Heyman. Put it that way. I think Al Heyman's been the greatest force for good in world boxing over the last decade. The last 10, 15 years has been Al Heyman, without a shadow of a doubt. All right, guys, look, have a great weekend. I didn't even think I was going to record today, but... Yeah, you know, felt creative, so I thought, yeah, why not? So have a great weekend, guys. Enjoy the fights. Um, as always, if you enjoy the content, share it. Introduce someone who hasn't listened before into the into the mafia, and let's let's keep growing it. Like one of the things I didn't realize, we're we're in October now. In January, my Facebook page is at two thousand two hundred and thirty six. We're on like twenty thousand five hundred now. Not one bought follower. Literally, not one bought follower. Just grinding. Yeah, every day having to invite a thousand people, every day invite, invite, invite. And I mean, it's it's getting there slowly. I, mean, I didn't think Facebook would be the most popular channel, but it's becoming that way. And if you guys are on the Facebook page, I thank you so much for that. Um, the growth has been good. Uh, I don't know, trying to think in terms of Insta, how have we grown this year? Oh, about, about 15%, I'd say, in terms of net growth. And Twitter just stays constant, uh, and I'm happy with that. But, I mean, all good signs, because at a time when numbers are dwindling, like, my numbers aren't falling, and, like, in Facebook's case, they're growing, so I'm grateful for that. You know, I don't have to post my stuff on other people's pages for traction anymore, which is always good. And on that note, I'll say take care, guys.